Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. I hope you're all doing well. Today, we're diving into a case that's unlike any other. A case that has seen six trials, decades of uncertainty, and has exposed deep-rooted racial biases in the American justice system. We're unraveling the haunting and complex story of Curtis Flowers, a man who spent 22 years on death row in Mississippi. This case has twists and turns that you won't believe, and it raises questions that we, as a society, cannot afford to ignore. So grab a cup of coffee, or maybe something stronger, because trust me, you'll want to stick around for this one. In 1996, the sleepy, tight-knit community of Winona, Mississippi, experienced a tragedy that would forever change its fabric. On a day that started like any other, four innocent workers, people who were friends, family, and neighbors to many in the town, were brutally shot dead at the tardy furniture store. The air was thick with disbelief and sorrow. The community was paralyzed with shock. Imagine walking into a local store where you'd usually greet familiar faces, only to find a horrifying scene of violence and death. That's what happened here. The walls that once showcased furniture and home decor were now tainted with the grim reality of life's fragility. The police were called, and the hunt for the killer began. It was a race against time, as every passing moment could either bring them closer to justice or let the perpetrator slip further away. The crime scene was meticulously combed for evidence, but the brutality of the act left everyone asking, who could commit such a heinous act, and why? The town was on edge, doors that were once left unlocked were now bolted, and the faces of the four victims became a constant, painful reminder of the evil that had invaded their peaceful lives. In the days following the shocking murders, the town was gripped by a palpable tension. People looked over their shoulders, whispered in hushed tones, and the sense of community was overshadowed by a cloud of fear and suspicion. It was during this time of heightened anxiety that Curtis Flowers, a local man, found himself thrust into a nightmarish situation. Curtis had briefly worked at Tardy Furniture, but had left the job after a disagreement. Whether it was a dispute over work conditions, pay, or something more personal, we can't say for sure. What we do know is that this disagreement suddenly became the focal point of a life-altering investigation for him. The police zeroed in on Curtis, and before he knew it, he was arrested and charged with the murders of the four tardy furniture employees. Imagine the whirlwind of emotions he must have felt. One moment, you're a regular citizen, and the next, you're being accused of a quadruple homicide. The weight of the world was suddenly on his shoulders, and the eyes of the community were all on him. Was he really capable of such a gruesome act? Or was he a convenient suspect in a town desperate for answers? The arrest sent additional shockwaves through the community. For some, it was a moment of relief, a sign that justice was on the horizon. For others, it raised more questions than answers, casting a shadow of doubt and racial tension that would come to define much of the case's future. The year was 1997, and Curtis Flowers found himself in a courtroom, not as a spectator, but as the accused in a quadruple murder case. But this wasn't a one-and-done trial. Oh no, this was just the opening act in a legal drama that would span over two decades. Curtis was tried an astonishing six times for the same crime. Let that sink in for a moment, six trials for the same case. It's almost unfathomable. The trials were mostly presided over by predominantly white juries, a point that cannot be overlooked given that Curtis Flowers is African American. The racial undertones were glaringly apparent, adding another layer of complexity to an already convoluted case. Each trial was like a gut-wrenching roller coaster for Curtis and his family. Imagine the emotional toll, the strain on his loved ones, and the financial burden of mounting a defense again and again, and for the community. Each trial was a reopening of old wounds, a stark reminder of the tragedy that had befallen them. But why so many trials? Was the evidence inconclusive? Were there procedural errors? Or was there something more sinister at play, like racial bias? These trials weren't just about Curtis Flowers. They were a reflection of the systemic issues plaguing the American justice system. The courtroom became a theater where the same grim play was performed over and over, each time with a slightly different cast but always with Curtis Flowers in the starring role of the accused. And each time, the question loomed larger, would justice ever truly be served? Now, every story has its key players, and in the legal odyssey of Curtis Flowers, District Attorney Doug Evans was a pivotal figure. Evans, a white man, was the driving force behind the prosecution, and his role has been fraught with controversy. Enter Madeline Barron, an investigator who decided to peel back the layers of this complex case. What she discovered about Evans was nothing short of alarming. She found that Evans had a history, a pattern, if you will, of systematically removing black jurors from trials. This wasn't a one-time occurrence. This was a recurring theme in his career. Imagine the gravity of this revelation. We're talking about a district attorney, a person vested with the power to seek justice, engaging in practices that are not just ethically questionable but also racially biased. This was a game-changer, not just for Curtis Flowers but for every black individual who had ever sat in a courtroom where Doug Evans was the prosecutor. 
The question then arises, how much of an impact did Evans' actions have on the outcomes of Curtis' trials? Was justice being served, or was it being manipulated? The racial dynamics in this case were not just a subplot. They were central to the narrative, casting a long, dark shadow over the proceedings. Barron's findings were like a jolt of electricity, shocking the community and the nation, and forcing us to confront uncomfortable truths about racial biases in the justice system. It was a wake-up call, one that begged us to question the very foundations of a system we trust to be fair and just. Now, if you've ever felt like you're stuck in a never-ending loop, imagine being Curtis Flowers, six trials, countless days in court, and years, yes years, behind bars. But then, in November 2018, something extraordinary happened. The U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear an appeal for Curtis' case. This wasn't just another chapter in the story. This was a seismic shift, a glimmer of hope in a tunnel that had been dark for far too long. The highest court in the land was now willing to take a closer look at a case that had been marred by racial biases and questionable legal practices. Think about the emotional roller coaster Curtis must have been on. After years of what seemed like an uphill battle, the scales of justice seemed to finally tip, even if just slightly, in his favor. The news must have been a beacon, not just for him, but for his family, his community, and for everyone who had been following this case, screaming into the void for justice to be served. The U.S. Supreme Court's decision to hear the appeal was more than just a legal formality. It was a statement, a message to the world that the justice system, despite its flaws, still has mechanisms to correct itself. It was a moment that rekindled faith in a system that had let down Curtis and many like him time and time again. This was the turning point, the moment when the narrative began to shift and the world started to pay attention. It was as if the universe itself was saying, enough is enough, let's re-examine what justice really means. Now, if you've been on the edge of your seat so far, brace yourself for this. In September 2020, in a groundbreaking, jaw-dropping turn of events, the charges against Curtis Flowers were dropped. Let that sink in for a moment. Nearly 24 years, almost a quarter of a century, of his life had been stolen from him, and finally, he was free. Imagine the emotional weight lifted off his shoulders, the tears of joy from his family, and the collective sigh of relief from everyone who had been advocating for his release. This was not just a legal victory. It was a triumph of the human spirit, a testament to resilience and the enduring quest for justice. Curtis had spent close to 24 years in prison, a place where hope is a rare commodity. He had been confined to a cell, isolated from the world, and yet, he never gave up. And neither did the people who believed in him. This moment was more than just a headline or a news alert on your phone. It was a life-altering event for Curtis and a stark reminder for all of us about the flaws in our justice system. It was a wake-up call that screamed, we must do better. The dropping of the charges was like a burst of light in a long, dark tunnel. It was a moment that restored some faith in a system that had been so deeply flawed. It was a moment that said, yes, sometimes justice takes its time. But it's never too late to make things right. Now, let's take a moment to think about Curtis Flowers' family. Can you even begin to fathom the emotional toll this entire ordeal has taken on them? Years of trials, retrials, appeals, and the ever-looming, gut-wrenching threat of a death sentence hanging over their loved one. It's been an unbearable reality, a never-ending nightmare that no family should ever have to endure. The emotional highs and lows, the hope followed by despair, and then hope again, it's been a relentless emotional whirlwind. Every court appearance, every news headline, every legal twist and turn has been a collective family experience, each moment etched into their hearts and minds. This is not just Curtis' story. It's the story of a family bound by love, hope, and an unyielding quest for justice. But let's zoom out for a second. This case has transcended the personal plight of Curtis and his family. It sent shockwaves through the nation and has become a glaring spotlight on the racial biases embedded in the American judicial system. People from all walks of life, from community activists to legal experts, have weighed in, sparking a national conversation that we desperately need to have. The case of Curtis Flowers isn't just a story. It's a societal mirror reflecting the imperfections and biases we still need to address. It's become a rallying cry for change, a case study in systemic flaws, and a lesson in the power of community advocacy. As we wrap up this emotional, gut-wrenching, yet ultimately hopeful journey into the life and trials of Curtis Flowers, let's not forget the lessons here. This story serves as a stark, unsettling reminder of the flaws, the cracks, and the deep-rooted biases in our judicial system. It's a call to action for each of us to stay informed, to stay empathetic, and to advocate for justice in our own ways. Thank you for joining me on this incredible journey. It's been an eye-opener, a tear-jerker, and a soul stirrer all rolled into one. So, as you go about your day, remember the story of Curtis Flowers. Stay informed, stay empathetic, and most importantly, stay just.